As noted in the last lecture, the key to trademark protection is distinctiveness, the idea that a mark identifies a particular source of goods or services and distinguishes it from competing offerings. With respect to word marks, trademark law has developed what is known as the spectrum of distinctiveness, often called the Abercrombie spectrum after the case that articulated the points of the spectrum. At one end, we have inherently distinctive marks. At the other, we have marks that require secondary meaning for protection. That is, the trademark holder establishes that consumers see the marks as performing a trademark function, or in the case of generic marks, marks that are not even eligible for protection in the first place. So I'm going to go through these categories one by one, and as we go through them, it's worth thinking about whether or not we agree that trademarks in those respective categories actually do a good job of performing the trademark function. Are they actually well suited to serve as repositories of meaning for information about particular goods or services? In addition, it's worth considering whether or not there's any harm or negative consequences of allowing trademarks in those particular categories to receive protection. So here is the spectrum of distinctiveness. And at one end, we have fanciful marks, then arbitrary, then suggestive marks, and then at the other end, we have descriptive marks. And I'm just going to leave off generic marks so we can limit ourselves to what is eligible for protection. And as you read trademark cases, you'll quickly see that there are many situations in which reasonable people can easily disagree about about whether a mark fits into one category or another, whether a mark is descriptive or suggestive or descriptive or arguably even generic in some cases. So let's start at one end of the spectrum of distinctiveness, and that is the so-called fanciful mark. These are invented words like Exxon, like Kodak. Is there a problem to competition in allowing trademarks to be held in so-called fanciful terms? Now the traditional answer is no. Because the trademark holder is coining a word, there is no depletion of existing available words. On this view, a competitor should be able to invent their own word if they want to have a fanciful mark. So this is why fanciful marks sit at one end of the spectrum of distinctiveness. Their protection doesn't pose a threat to competition, for competitors can make up their own fanciful terms. Though note this interesting article challenging the premise that the marks are ever truly fanciful. And as for distinctiveness, courts made the assumption that when buyers see a fanciful term applied on a label or the like, there will be a natural tendency to say, ah, that made-up word must be the name of a product and indicate a particular unique source. And then that made-up word can serve as a repository of meaning for available information about the product. Now, staying on the inherently distinctive end of the spectrum, we next have so-called arbitrary marks. These are everyday words that do not describe or directly relate to particular goods or services, Apple computer being the classic example. Here too, we have this view that there is really no danger to competition of allowing terms like these to be trademarked, as there are an awful lot of words out there. So the computer seller who loses out on Apple can get a hold of some other arbitrary term. You could call it a pear, you could call it a Christmas tree, you could call it a chair. Now, there's some recent scholarship suggesting that the supply of available marks may not be so large given how many trademarks are out there, but that's the baseline assumption of trademark law. And again, there's an assumption that juxtaposing goods or services with unrelated words will produce a natural tendency in buyers to treat the terms as performing a trademark function. That computer is clearly not a fruit, so Apple must be the signal of its source. From there, we move on to so-called suggestive marks. Here the idea is not that the word describes the product, but it isn't unrelated either. Rather, it suggests something about it. If you look at the product and the mark in conjunction with each other, your brain may make some kind of what courts have called an imaginative leap that will connect the two. So Netflix, if you don't think it's a fanciful term, Netflix suggests a service that brings movie access to the internet. Or think about Tide for detergent. Tide doesn't describe what the detergent does, but it could suggest the idea of cleaning. Just as the Tide cleans off what's on the beach, so too will Tide detergent make your laundry clean. Now, I suppose we could also make the argument that maybe Tide is actually arbitrary. That possibility reflects the fact that suggestive marks often have a potential overlap with arbitrary marks, and reasonable people can disagree about where the mark is properly classified. But because suggestive marks are treated as inherently distinctive, the precise line between these two categories does not really matter for purposes of trademark eligibility, although it can matter when it comes to infringement analysis, and we'll talk about that in later lectures. But for now, let's move on to the next stop on the spectrum, and that is descriptive marks. 
A descriptive mark is a mark that describes a quality or characteristic of the branded good or service. Now here, there's actually a real cash value to whether or not we place the mark in the descriptive or the suggestive box, because descriptive marks are not inherently distinctive. You actually have to show that your mark has developed secondary meaning with the consuming public for it to be protected. And so why is that? Why might we want to require secondary meaning of descriptive marks? First of all, we may have a suspicion that the descriptive term is not in fact performing a trademark function. So say you see a hamburger being described as tasty. Maybe there's a tendency in the mind to automatically assume that, well, that's a description of the good, or it's an asserted quality of the good, but it's not necessarily a source indicator because, of course, anyone who sells hamburgers is going to want to tout their product as being tasty or something along those lines. Given that, when you see a descriptive term, there doesn't seem to be a kind of differentiation going on, as you would have if you saw the trademark eagle attached to a hamburger. Eagles have no connection to hamburgers. There isn't a brand out there that says, you know, our burgers are made from real eagles. So because there's no real ex-ante connection between eagles and hamburgers in the consuming public's mind, trademark law's empirical assumption is that eagle will be seen as a term of differentiation. The eagle burger is made by someone different than the other hamburger makers I see when I go out in the hamburger marketplace. Whereas when one sees tasty, well, any number of people who sell hamburgers are going to describe their burgers as being tasty. There's no real differentiation there. But let's move from the question of when marks identify and distinguish goods to other policies that may be in play in trademark doctrine and why trademark doctrine is skeptical of descriptive marks. We might also want to think about threats to competition. What happens if one seller is able to claim a descriptive term as a mark? Does that threaten the ability of competitors to use that term in advertising and other communications with potential buyers? If yes, we want to limit the ability of trademark holders to use descriptive trademarks as a potential sword against their rivals. As we'll discuss in greater detail in later lectures, trademark doctrine actually does have protections to ensure that competitors can use descriptive words even when they are the subject of trademark protection. But one way to implement this goal is to make trademark protection more difficult on the front end. That is, you have less of a problem if there are fewer protected descriptive marks in the marketplace. Because it matters whether a mark is descriptive and not suggestive, suggestive, defining the border between the two categories matters, and can matter a great deal, but it's not easy. The line between describing a product and suggesting something about it can be a pretty fine one. Think about a term like style for a hair care product. Is that suggestive in that there's a sort of imaginative step that says, this container is not style, but ah, yes, if I put this on my hair, maybe I'll look a little bit better. Or is it a straightforward claim? that using this product is going to make you look stylish. Now, this can be a pretty fine distinction to a purchaser, but it matters a lot to the seller if the seller cannot show secondary meaning, that consumers actually associate the term style with a particular source of hair care products. So the person claiming the trademark is going to argue the case that the connection between the term style and the product requires an imaginative leap on the part of purchasers. And you can imagine the counterargument in that context, that the term actually conveys an immediate idea of the ingredients, qualities, or characteristics of the hair care product. Now, this kind of conflict has happened a lot in trademark law, and the line between descriptive and suggestive marks requires fact-finding that can often go either way. So I have two lists on the screen right now. They come from Professor McCarthy's treatise, and one is a set of marks that were deemed to be descriptive by the courts, and another is a set of marks that were deemed to be suggestive. Which is which? You can imagine you're on a game show. Okay, here's the answer. Now, maybe if you studied this list for a while, you'd have guessed which list is which. But if you're at all like me, you'll see any number of examples within the descriptive list that maybe should have been deemed suggestive and vice versa. So given how easy it is for an entity to select an inherently distinctive mark, why do we have so much litigation over whether or not a mark is descriptive, given how easy it is to stay away from the line? Why do so many trademark holders or would-be trademark holders elect to come so close to the line? Well, a trademark is a repository of meaning for your product. You want to imbue your mark with positive attributes and associations. You want it to symbolize and reflect goodwill with your customers. But of course, insofar as you want to imbue your mark with positive characteristics, why not do some of that work in the name? In other words, why not engage in a form of simultaneous advertising if you can? And won't that be the kind of thing that might make your marks more easily remembered by consumers? 
Recall, we talked in a previous lecture about the power of consumer inertia and the difficulty of moving consumers to explore new possibilities when they are limited by time, resources, and the like. Consumers may understandably be reluctant to expend the resources, the search costs, to expose themselves to new possibilities. Well, if you can imbue your trademark with some advertising in the actual name, with some actual information about the product, maybe you can circumvent some of that hurdle. And that's one of the virtues of suggestive marks, the ability to plant a seed in the minds of potential purchasers. And indeed, for some consumers, maybe appreciating that connection, making the link between the suggestion and the product itself, may even be a source of some cognitive pleasure that might be something that might benefit a seller. So a suggestive mark may lower advertising costs while at the same time being an inherently distinctive mark. But of course, people are fallible, and sometimes you're going to make a mistake and you think you've got a mark that is suggestive and is deemed to be descriptive. Sure, you can avoid that issue altogether by selecting an arbitrary or fanciful mark. Those are ideal in the sense of being the sort of neutral vessels for the kinds of meaning that a seller may want to put into the mark. But of course, now you have to assume the added burden of educating the public for what exactly those marks mean. Say consumers have no priors about what an eagle salad is. On the plus side, it's a tabula rasa. You can actually imbue it with the meaning that you want. But now you have to do all the work because eagle is arbitrary as applied to salads. If you had a more suggestive term, say like regal, to suggest the kind of thing that royalty might eat, or you know, more to the purple, if you want to take the royalty theme further, something of that kind plants the seed in the consuming public's mind that this is something of particularly high quality. And that might be preferable to a purveyor of salads than something more arbitrary like eagle. Now the last category in the spectrum is of course generic marks, and I have a longer lecture coming up about generic marks in general, but basically generic marks identify product categories. So things like wine, diapers, rather than a particular kind of wine or a particular kind of diaper. Generic marks receive no protection, and by now it shouldn't be too hard to see why, both from the perspective of distinctiveness and from the perspective of effects on competition. If generic terms could be protected, we'd potentially have bizarre situations in which you go to a store and ask for red wine and get handed a particular brand called red wine. You say, oh no, I, I don't like this particular brand. Could you show me some other kind of red wine? And you go, oh, I'm sorry, this is red wine. What's that? Oh, you mean our red fermented grape beverage. Oh, we have other kinds of red fermented grape beverages over there. Now, that's just a waste of time for everyone. No one wants that to be the case in the marketplace. And so you can see the kinds of potential problems that protecting generic marks would have on consumer search costs and on competition. Protecting terms that do not actually distinguish goods and services in the marketplace do not promote the goals of trademark law. So that's a summary of the spectrum of distinctiveness. In the videos to come, we'll talk some more about complications and applications of the spectrum. Thanks for watching.